Um, Lindsay is in fact in Zimbabwe, but I'm incredibly delighted that Roz is here. We have got Lindsay's book for sale downstairs. Um, as Daisy said, Marie was a great friend of ours, and she came to lots of five by fifteens before she was before she was killed. And it's uh, it's both moving and very wonderful for all her friends, many of whom are here, to have you having played her. So, how did it begin, Roz? How did you? find Marie? How did the whole project start? Well, I mean, there was obviously... I know Marie apparently was often thinking about making a film of her own life. Um, and I know she, she did talk to people about it. Um, and maybe the sad thing was there wasn't an ending. Um, and, uh, and I heard that some people were thinking about making a film about Marie and I thought, well, this could be brilliant, but it could also be awful. <laughs> you know, it could be a sort of Hollywoodization of the glamorous war correspondent, and, you know, it would come with lots of swashbuckle and probably kind of empty bravado. And then when I heard that Matt Heinemann, who's, who's known for documentaries, was going to do it, I thought, well, here's someone who, you know, if given free reign, will be able to give us a penetrating look at a, a very interesting complicated, beloved person. Um, and so I, I tried to meet him to see if he wanted a collaborator. Um, because the only thing I really cared about was giving him a, an embodiment of Marie that meant that he could follow her as if he was making a documentary. Because I thought the ma really amazing thing would be is if Matt Heinemann had made a documentary about Marie. Yes, so um, it, it does have a, a very strong documentary element to it, doesn't it? I mean, you recreate a lot of war scenes. Yes, um, and, and uh, you know, I was thinking hearing William talk, I was thinking, gosh, everything that you're saying is so much about what Marie believed, which is sort of making something that feels very remote, very accessible. You know, she, would, she had this uncanny ability to bring these conflicts that seemed to us very far away. She'd make you engage with a detail. She'd, she'd, she'd talk about a woman she met and you'd think of your sister or your daughter or your friend. Um, and, you know, when Matt set about doing the film, he was most worried that we wouldn't achieve a level of authenticity that he, he had managed to do in his, you know, obviously does in his documentaries. So we, we were filming in Jordan and he decided that the only way to really give this a true flavor would be to interview as many people as he could find who had come, who were living, currently living in Jordan, who were from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, any of the conflict zones that we were covering. And, and, and you know, there's probably people here who work in film, but normally the, the background tapestry of a film is cast by a second assistant director, mostly looking at photographs. Now, Matt interviewed maybe 500 people, and he found people whose stories tallied with the people that Marie had written about in her articles. So the film takes us to Syria, to Homs, where Marie lost her life. And, um, and Matt set me up in a room, very similar to the one that Marie wrote a very stinging article about what she called the widow's basement, which is where women and children were sheltering when Homs was under siege. And I walked into this room and it was it was just a sea of faces. It was a sea of women, children, blankets. And Matt said, okay, here is your room. He said, you, you've got a translator. You can go where you want. And we had a very skilled cameraman. And I had completely free reign. And I, and I you know, went and sat down with one woman and then another. And, and the stories that came out, you know, they were not, it's not, fiction, it's truth, it's their truth. And, and suddenly I had this insight into what Marie did again and again and again. And of course she wrote for a Sunday paper so she had time to listen and to pay attention and to, you know, get, get into people's souls. And this one woman, she told me that she was unable to breastfeed her child when she moved into the shelter because of the stress and she could only feed this child sugar and water because her milk had dried up and there were no supplies. And I said, so what had happened? And she said, well, her house was hit when a car bomb exploded outside it. And she'd fled with her three children. And she, 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 she turned around 
she had two of her daughters with her, and she turned around, and one of the children was missing. And so I said, well, was, was your child under the rubble? And she said, yes, she was under the rubble. I said, how old was she? She said, she was five. And then she looked at me, and she said, I don't want this story just to be words in your paper. She said, I want the world to know this story. And I thought, my goodness, you know, this has completely blurred the line between, you know, this, this woman is talking to me as a journalist now. I, I am, to all intents and purposes, I am not an actress, I am a journalist, and she is entrusting me with her life to go and take care of it. And, and I thought, my goodness, that is what Marie had for four decades, that kind of experience, that you can see it still has a, you know, profound effect, and that's just one example. So you know, it was a huge insight into what the cost is, really, to any correspondent delivering us these truths and, of course, wondering whether we'll care when the story gets to us. A bit like, you know, but when you do bother to engage, just like, you know, I feel that your talk was so relevant, really. Um, when you do bother to engage, you, you feel that hand reaching out. You know, you feel this connection. And I think, you know, making the film... And I think what Marie gained from her life doing that job was, was the perspective, you know, the, the gaining of another perspective which enriches everything that you understand about life. Did it make you feel responsible when that woman said, I want you to tell my story? Because I've always thought about Marie, I mean, that how many people's stories she listened to in her life, and she couldn't probably have told every single one, but the, the weight of the responsibility of that pain and the fact yeah. that that woman was prepared, wanted to say to you, do something about this situation. You know, take my pain and change this, help me change the situation. Did you, did you feel that, even in that? Yes, yes, what a burden that, what, what a burden. And, and, you know, it's a complicated one because you feel it and you feel grief and you feel, but it's not your grief to feel, you know, so it does move you, but you think, what right do I have to feel? Because, you know, you're, it's this person's pain, not mine. But my goodness, you feel it. So then the question is, where does it go? Um, and how do you filter? How do you choose? But I think, you know, Marie's articles, they, they stay with you because of that detail, because she never wrote about numbers, because she wasn't, you know, talking about so many bodies were buried. She wanted the story of this person and that person and this man's father and... Um, you know, there's, uh, and Lindsay gets that very much across in her book, which uh, is wonderful. It was a wonderful thing to kind of, because I missed Marie when I finished doing the, um, the film. You know, again, <laughs> William's talk about, you know, somebody you can never meet, and yet you feel unbelievably connected to. You know, it's a very odd thing. You all knew her. I never knew her, and yet I have this funny intimacy with somebody who I've come to love, who I don't know. <laughs> yes, it must, it must be very strange. I mean, Marie was very complex, as indeed comes over in the film and comes over in the book. Did you start to kind of get... You, I mean, you portray it so well, the, the party person, the, the woman who would wear up her underwear, who also would never give up and would go back into dangerous situations. I mean, she was... She was more complicated than I, I think anyone I know in that sense, who, you know, the not giving upness as well. Yeah, sometimes it was funny when I read Lindsay's book and I didn't read it, I didn't have access to Lindsay when we were making the film. There was one bit that she, she Lindsay had access to Marie's diaries and she said that, you know, there was one extract where Marie said, I just don't want to be Marie. I don't want to have to walk across the room and be Marie. And... Um, you know, but these, these were pressures that when you live inside someone, as it were, I'd felt that. That wasn't a surprise to me. Um, and when Sean Ryan, who was her foreign editor at the Sunday Times, when he saw the film, he said, these were Marie's that I recognized, you know, this fierce pursuit of a story. Yeah. And then this intense vulnerability as well. And both things live, you know, inside the same person, obviously. <laughs> you did a huge amount of physical preparation because I mean, when I came and saw that bit when you're in the apartment mm. um, and you appeared wearing a black and white dress that could absolutely have been I mean was hers I think as far as I can remember and I was quite far away from you and I was so taken back I mean I just burst into tears and had to leave but you were so like her it was quite extraordinary I mean the hair and, you, and I read somewhere reading reading an interview you'd given that you lost a centimetre in height. 
Is that right in the course of making the film? I mean, yes, because Marie again, this this sort of pursuit of wanting to give Matthew a a, a figure that he could follow like a documentary. I knew that I had to be Marie, and she compelled me so much. I didn't want to, you know, harness this to my own thing and and sort of get all Marie's characteristics, but sort of be me. I I. I I thought she was so charismatic mm. that I had to embody that. So that meant changing everything, changing my hair, changing my voice, learning to smoke, um, which is harder than you think, actually, to I really do it with like commitment, you know. Smoke no, the, the, the best note I got was you have to understand that everything is better with a cigarette. This conversation, <laughs> this, <laughs> this talk, <laughs> this drink, this sound, everything is, is this car journey. Um, and I, and I started to leave the house, you know, keys, bags. And then I was driving my car and thought, okay, I've just got to smoke at every opportunity. And I sort of thought, well, I can do this and I can smoke and drive and this is all going terribly well. And then I ash out of the window and of course it all blows back in my face. And I think, okay, no, that's clearly not what smokers do. But, <clears throat> um, but then changing her physicality and uh, changing my own physicality uh, to try and get her walk. And, and she was this such a combination of elegance and a very sort of odd body language, which, um, and I started, I wanted to, 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 to carry my shoulders because she had tremendous freedom, but tremendous tension too. Mm. And I, and it felt like there was always this sort of rigidity around the back that was almost like you were primed for what might happen. And, and then I went to do a medical for my next film because they examine you quite intensely when they, um, when you're gonna do a film. And, and she measured me, the doctor, and wrote down my height, and I said, I don't think that's right. I said, I think I'm 173 centimeters, and you've written down 172. She said, well, actually, you're 171 and a half, but I rounded it up. And I thought, my God, I've, I've actually lost a centimeter and a half in playing Marie, <laughs> which is quite cool in a way that, you know, physical transformation can be real, um, but also quite alarming. Um, but it was a, it, it was, it was great, and I think these, you know, there were times on set where friends of Marie was, were, were there, you came, and, and Paul Conroy, who Jamie Dornan plays brilliantly in the film, which opens on the 1st of February, and it's called A Private War. There's a way to get to it. <laughs> and uh, and um, Paul Conroy, actually, who was, who was the photographer who was with Marie when, when in Homs, he came out for a couple of days to sort of get us on our feet and then he never left. Because I think what people don't realize is, is the level of authenticity that can be achieved by a film. And the fact that there are departments pouring over photographs of, these, of, of, of people, of lives, of situations. So when Paul walked into the media center where he and Marie were based, you know, as Holmes was under shell fire and the walls were crumbling, I mean, he, he kind of, lost it, for want of a better word, because, you know, the mattresses were the same, the blankets were the same, the layout was the same, because the set designer had looked, and similarly, that dress that you mentioned was not Marie's, it was just that our costume designer had poured over photos. My mm -hmm. trailer was covered in pictures of Marie, and we willed that dress to come back to life, and he made it. He found fabric and reconstructed well, it. Paul has stood on this stage. He, um, he came shortly after Marie was killed, and he was actually still in hospital, and we didn't realize when he accepted to come quite how sick he was. He probably unplugged all no, his wires no, and no, got no. himself... No, no, he came with the wires. <laughs> <laughs> he came actually with the antibiotic drip um, in hospital pajamas, and it did give you an incredible sort of sense of how dedicated he was, but was there anything that was very difficult to do about playing her? Was there anything where Paul's? you felt... Um, I mean, like, for instance, the decision to go back into Homs, the fatal decision. Was there a part of you who's thinking, I mean, because I've always wondered, why did you go back? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, was there, a, was there a loss of judgment at that point? It was a compulsion that felt bigger than you, you know, the big, bigger than her, I think. I mean, I came to understand Marie as someone who was quite chaotic in home life, and, and, and sometimes I feel that when you're quite chaotic in home life and you go to somewhere where chaos reigns, you paradoxically feel quite calm, 
in that mm -hmm. environment, that there's a sort of leveling where, you know, the stakes are absolute and you can define them and you kind of know where things stand. Um, I think she was... I, I feel quite nervous about talking about it because I think people know her better than me. Um, but I think she believed passionately that she could make a difference, that she was the one who could call it out as a lie. You know, she was in there in Homs when the narrative that was out there was that Assad was going after terrorist gangs and she had seen a city of cold, starving civilians. Mm. And so that CNN broadcast, which she bravely did, but only, people have only ever heard the audio. And of course, Paul described the scene and I got to play the scene of it, which was such an extraordinary thing to do because you know, the world was falling apart. The, the building they were in was shattering. You know, they were being shelled. And this calm voice, knowing absolutely what she wanted to say, rang out across the airwaves. But she was huddled under blankets, freezing. You know, the line was bad. There were guns outside. There were explosions. And, and to, to sort of bring to life that moment was... I don't think I moved for the two hours or whatever that we were shooting it, because I think I felt the same thing that she'd obviously felt, was just the certainty that these words would hit. And you also the, the fear, presumably, at that point that you might get pinpointed, yes. and indeed they did. Yes, they did, and, and that was the, you know, I don't know how she felt when she finished that broadcast, but I know how I felt as her, which is, you know, you release that into the world and then, and then you deflate. What, what next? What, is, mm. what comes next? You know you've done something good, but then it's not in your hands anymore. That's it's right. out there. Yes. And, and of course, I, I've now actually had the privilege of meeting Marie's sister. Um, and it is so odd, you know, when you've thought about these people in somebody's life and, you know, the family were not that welcoming of a film being made. Understandably, I do get it. And then the kind of gift when suddenly I was doing a screening of the film in the Hamptons and I looked up in the audience and there was Kat Colvin sitting there and I sort of couldn't speak for about <laughs> two minutes. I was in the middle of answering a question and literally couldn't speak because I've thought about this woman for months on end and there she was. But now we've had the chance to um, really spend some time and, and she's actually bringing a, a lawsuit against the Assad regime for the targeting, deliberate targeting of her sister. And there's evidence that Marie was followed um, from when she left Beirut. Um, there's a growing, growing body of evidence um, that she was a target. So do you wish you'd had a different career, become a journalist? I wish I'd had her courage. I think that's the, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of talk about the fearless war correspondent. I don't think Marie was fearless. I think the really beautiful thing about her is that she had tremendous fear and, um, and overcame it. I think that's the really, that's real courage in my book. Um, no, I think she had a calling. I think there were times in her life, like in East Timor, um, where she changed the course of history by, by her presence, by her words, by staying there. In East Timor, the, there was a UN compound and the situation was becoming untenable and the UN were going to evacuate. And, uh, and Marie, the, you know, all journalists were leaving, all personnel were leaving, and Marie stayed with three, two other women. And when her editor rang and said, you know, what do you mean you didn't get on the plane? She said, well, if I stay, if I, don't, if I leave, then these people are condemned to certain death. And he was like, well, who's with you? And she named the two other women who were with her. And he was like, what? He said, well, where have all the men gone? She said, I guess they don't make men like they used to. <laughs> it is a great line. No, it is a great line. We, we couldn't sadly use it because our film starts <laughs> afterwards. But anyway, I've said it now, so. <laughs> um, right, I think our time is almost up. But you're about to play another Marie, aren't you? Or you have done her. Yes, I went, I went uh, from playing Marie Colvin to playing Marie Curie, which was very strange that these two Maries came, came Both at the marvelous. same time. Both extraordinary, yeah. Um, and I found out afterwards that the name Marie, there's obviously the religious the 
there's Mary and Mother of God and all that, but there's, but there's, but there's a spirit of rebellion in the name Marie. Good. I think that's pretty good. Pretty good <laughs> note to end on. <laughs> okay, well, one, uh, for one night only on Wednesday, there's a Q&A and a screening, um, and tickets can be got... Sorry? Oh, 4th of February. Sorry, completely wrong date. Um, the tickets for Wednesday are sold out, aren't they? But, the minute. but we've got Lindsay's book downstairs and also in it details about the charity that has been set up by Jane Wellesley and Lindsay and Lees, um, which looks after women war correspondents who are sort of on their own, who don't have the big protection of a newspaper. Um, and we arrange mentors for them and it's going incredibly well, but it always needs more donations. Anyway, there's these bookmarks that Jane has brought, and they're downstairs. And as is Lindsay's wonderful book. But please go and see the film, which opens on the 15th nationwide, yes? I, I thought it was yeah, the first. Anyway, it does I, open I, I know very film. little about these things. It opens things. on the 15th nationwide. It's, um, it's pretty grueling and completely amazing, and Rosamond is so like Marie that for anyone who knew her, it will really leave you pretty breathless. Thank you very much.